Well, tonight's message uh, is entitled, The Power of One More. Now, when I say one more, I, I don't mean one more bag of chips or one more M&M or one more car wash in Lafayette. But rather, I'm talking about one more life that gets radically changed by the power of God. One more family that gets put back together because of something that Jesus did in their life. And it's a segue into a, what I want to talk to you tonight about, and that is evangelism. So rather than have service, I've rented a massive bus. We're going to get on it, go to Acadiana Mall, and we're all going to witness to everybody in Acadiana Mall. I can see the terror in your eyes. <laughs> First thoughts that probably come through your mind, Rob, you're crazy. I'm not doing it. You do it. In fact, most Christians, when you talk to them about sharing their faith, they become very afraid. They're very fearful. They don't know how to do it. And the whole idea and even the word paralyzes them to no end. It happened to me when I got saved through the Baptist church in Atlanta. I didn't know. They had Monday night visitation. And we had a little quick lesson on how to do it. And here we go in our cars, out and about into the community. We, each of us, we had, we were pairs of two. We had about maybe three or four house visits on the Monday afternoon. And when I say, I was shaking in my boots. What have I gotten myself into? I'm letting them do it. I'm just going to drive. And all I can remember is praying, Lord, may they not be home. In the second house, may they not be home. Third house and fourth house, may they not be home. The first two were not home, but we had to go through the third. But anyway, I was terrified of publicly speaking about Jesus because I didn't know much about Jesus back then. And so it was very paralyzing to me. In fact, the research institute, the George Borner Institute, determined that nine out of ten people who would like to share their faith don't because it's so paralyzing and they wind up failing at it. Nine out of ten, ninety percent say this, why go share my faith when I'm just going to fail? It's not fun to do something that you know 90% of the time it's not going to go good for you, right? So I just wanted to share with you that tonight we're going to talk about evangelism. And even George Borner went on to say that most Christians would rather be comfortable in spiritual activity at the church than getting out into the highways and byways because they're safe and they're successful when they come to church. Does that make sense? And so I have a question for you. Are you called to church or are you, or are you called to the community? If you're called to the church, we can become very safe. It can become very easy. 
when we're called to the church, when it comes to evangelism, we say, well, let's just let the church do it. I'll invite. Get somebody here and y'all take it from there. Y'all close the deal. If we're called to the church, then it becomes very comfortable for us. But being called to your community takes on a whole different dynamic. It becomes intentional. It, it becomes uh, kind of like in your DNA to do that. But it also requires a change. It requires an adjustment on our thinking. Because we have to change from just bringing them to church and looking at the responsibility of the churches Two, it's my responsibility. We have to change our mentality because from playing it safe to carrying the burden for people. Remember I said the power of one more. Isn't it awesome when you see someone make a change in their life because of what Jesus did. Maybe you're here because of somebody pouring into you. We'll say, oh, we I'll let the professional do it, but we got to change that to I'll do it. We have to change the mentality of I'll tell them how lost they are, but we got to change it to we got to tell them how loved they are. We got to change it from making sinners mad to making sinners hungry. Amen. You see, until we make the change, until we make the adjustment, we're going to just fit right into 90%. And Jesus has something to say about the 90%. In fact, he tells us in Matthew chapter 5, and I love this, and I'm going to read it out of the message because it really brings home not only what our purpose in life is, but what God's will for our life is. In fact, if I made a poll right here and said, how many of you don't know your purpose in life? I would think that there would be a lot of hands well, I'm about ready to give you your purpose in life. Are you ready? Would you like to know what that is? Matthew chapter 5, it starts in verse 13. Jesus says, let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be the light bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. And look what he says. We're going public with this as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop on the light stand, light stand, what does he say? Shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Jesus says, let me tell you why you're here. And we also see it in Acts chapter 13 and verse 47. It says this, For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Emphasis on you. He didn't say you're going to become the light of the world. He says you are the light of the world. And he says you will bring salvation. See, this is the command. 
I'm just trying to help you to get out of that 90% and, and drop that thing down to 0%. Amen? See, this is really the DNA of evangelism. Is that we've been called to do it. It doesn't matter our ethnic background or our socioeconomic background or where we're from, who our mama is, can she cook a gumbo? Jesus gave us our purpose when it comes to evangelism. Sadly, some of us were taught that evangelism was like the guy who was a great fisherman, and I would like to read a story to you. Did you hear the story about the man who was a phenomenal fisherman? He was so good that his fame spread far and wide. When everyone else was catching only two or three fish a day, he was racking in two to three hundred per day. How many of you want to know where he was fishing? Eventually, the local game warden caught on and started to investigate because it just sounded too good to be true. On a certain day, the game warden showed up at the man's door, identified himself, and asked to go fishing with him. The man was agreeable to that, and off they went to the lake. When they got into the boat, immediately the warden noticed that there was something off and a little different. The man did not have fishing poles or tackle. All he had was a small duffel bag. So off they went, chatting about this and that until the man maneuvered his boat to the middle of the lake. He anchored without a word. He turned off the motor, reached into his duffel bag, and pulled out a stick of dynamite. Before the warden could say anything, he lit it and threw it into the water. It exploded with a mighty roar and stunned fish by the dozens floating to the surface. The man calmly started his boat and began gathering all the fish in his net. The warden said, now see here, this is highly illegal. But the man just laughed and steered the boat to another part of the lake, reached into his bag and pulled out a second stick of dynamite, and sure enough, more fish floated to the surface. By this time, the warden had seen enough. He said, Mister, you've broken so many laws, I can't even begin to count them. The man just laughed and pulled out another stick of dynamite. The warden kept on talking. This is illegal possession of dynamite and illegal detonation of dangerous material and disturbing the peace and about a half dozen other misdemeanors and felonies. While the warden was talking, the fisherman calmly lit another stick of dynamite and handed it to the game warden. And as he did, he looked at the game warden and asked, are you going to talk or are you going to fish? You see, that's how we've been taught to evangelize. Is we gotta have everything right and we gotta stick a dynamite and we're just gonna throw it and everything's gonna be good. But how many of you know that's not really the proper way to, to evangelize is to have a duffel bag of dynamite? We're gonna do no, more harm than good, amen? And so tonight I just wanna give you a very, very, very simplified approach to reaching one more. One more. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, one more. Because we're after one more. We must be after one more. If we don't, someone else will reach out to them and it will be the wrong way. Amen? So God has called us. He says, you, you and me are to do this. One more is all we need. One more. And I call it the BLT 
approach to evangelism. And the B stands for build relationships with non-Christians. Amen? It's what Jesus did at the well. He was a Jew. She was a Samaritan. He didn't belong there. And the next thing you know, they're starting a conversation. You see Jesus building an, a, a very close relationship with this woman because they had something in common. They were both thirsty. Jesus was a master at building relationships, don't you think? He was the supreme builder of relationships. In fact, we see it in Mark chapter 2. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, that's Matthew, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at his house, or Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were there. Jesus was attracted to everyone. And he just simply built relationship after relationship after relationship. When it comes to evangelism, I think that that's the very first thing we have to do is build relationships with people. Rather than come with our stick of dynamite and say, if you don't turn, you're going to burn. Folks, we can't do that. Amen? I absolutely love this part of evangelism is building relationships. Jesus wants us to get into their world. Amen? He wants us to find out who they are. I love talking to people and, and really finding out who they are. I don't mind talking to y'all. Y'all are Christians. Y'all, you know, I don't mind. Some of y'all a little, ooh, ooh, ooh. but anyway, y'all are okay. It's the non-Christians that I'm after. How about you? It's where we live. It's where we work. It's our neighbors. If we don't go after them, somebody else will. And it won't turn out good. Amen. We have to be intentional. We have to work on being a light with these people as we get into their world. I love talking to them. You start finding out information like, what do they like to do? Do, do they like to hunt? Do they like to fish? Do they like to play golf? Come on now. Give me a shout out for those of you that like to play golf. But once you get in their world, man, they open that door. It's like when you tell them, hey, tell me about yourself. You better sit down for an hour because they're going to tell you about themselves. But that's what you want. You can't go into a conversation with loaded dynamite. You must start with building relationships. you got to make friends with these people. Amen? And not come across as all churchy with all the Christiany sayings. We got to be gentle. If you get them to love you, they're going to love Jesus. Amen. I find the best way to build relationships is just simply to be a listener. Listen to what they are saying because every word that they utter is extremely important. You find out where they're from. You find out what they like to do. You find out what, uh, where they like to shop. You find out a lot of information when you just simply sit back and listen as you build relationships with these people. The problem is, is that if we lose our passion for people, if we lose our passion for the lost, it's because we're not in their world anymore. 
How many of you have a neighbor that's lost? Just going over and saying, hey, I, I have an issue because maybe he's a good car mechanic. Hey, I got this issue. Can you come over? And the next thing you know, you're drumming up conversation. And you know, most conversations that I get in when I'm building a relationship, I never mention what I do for a living. Never. I don't even bring up Jesus. I don't even bring up religion. You know what I'm saying? I'm getting into their world. Is this making sense? I'm getting into their world where they live. If they ask me, what do I do for a living? I just say, hey, I work at a church. Sometimes they want to know, know more. Sometimes they're like, well, that's cool. Hey, somebody's got to work at a church. <clears throat> they have no clue what I do. I don't like doing that. I'm just helping you out here. A very simple approach to evangelizing and getting into their world. The L of the BLT is you want to look for opportunities. Colossians 4, 5 says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. It involves you actually looking for them and recognizing that they're there right in front of you. I wonder how many times that we've literally walked by an opportunity that was literally handed to us and we just walk right by it. Last month, Michelle and I were in Boston. She gifted me a trip after I had finished chemo two years ago. We couldn't go. We went to Fenway Park. And long story short, we did some sightseeing one day and we went to the Boston Public Library, which is the oldest public library in America. It was built around... I don't know, mid-1800s or so, 1850 maybe. It's a building that you would not think is a library. It, it looks like it's one of those marble buildings in Rome or in Washington, D.C. It's, it's just gorgeous. So we walk in, and we had actually prayed that morning at our apartment and said, Lord, I know we're on vacation, but we don't want to take a vacation from you. So maybe, Lord, give us, give us somebody to reach out to, maybe to encourage, to talk to, or whatever. So a couple hours later, we're at the public library, and we walk through it, and we're just amazed at the, the artistry and the sculptures and just the ornament. Oh, my gosh, it just blows your mind that a library would look like that. It was breathtaking. And so we walk through this other hallway, and we made our way into this outdoor courtyard that had tons of tables. People were out there drinking coffee. They were on the iPads. You know, they were talking. And so you have to kind of walk around to get back out. And as we were walking around, we see this young lady with what looked to be her parents. And they were trying to bless their hearts, take a selfie. And it wasn't working out. So Michelle said, hey, would you like for me to take your picture? And the young lady said, yes, that would be wonderful. So we kind of stopped everything and we started talking to them. And we said, what brings you guys? Are y'all from Boston? No, well, the daughter was because she just graduated college like a few days before the parents had come up. They were sightseeing kind of like us. And then his daughter says, well, my dad is battling cancer. You just teed me up a, a high thing on a golf course. Oh, really? And then Michelle just takes it from there. And says, we're here because my husband went through cancer. And, you know, and so we had a common interest. But you could tell he was kind of shying away because Michelle said, let me tell you, God was faithful to my husband. He, he, he healed him radically. And you could tell he had a little pushback. And so Michelle went there and said, well, do you believe in God? Well, 
Okay, you've just opened up the door for us. Thank you, Lord. What we just prayed for about two hours earlier. He says, oh, my wife, she's a believer. Here I am, the pastor. I just backed away and Michelle went for it. <laughs> and started talking to him and ministering to him in a loving way. We didn't have a stick of dynamite. But it was an opportunity that we could not resist. And we had, we had to stop whatever we were doing and just talk to him. It was maybe five, six, seven, eight minutes. It wasn't long. But Michelle encouraged him to put his faith in God. That God was going to raise him up just like he raised me up. And I even encouraged him as well. And so we felt like that that was a divine opportunity for us to walk through. Amen. We could have very well have said, yeah, it's an opportunity. I'm on vacation. I'm not doing this. Look for opportunities to be around you when you're building relationships. And there will be a door that's going to open up so wide. And can I just throw a little nugget at you? Find that, that common interest and just ask some questions. Amen. And then God will give you an opportunity to share some things with these people. And the amazing thing is, sometimes they're just natural opportunities that happen. Saturday, I got a phone call. It was my weekend to cover. A lady called in on behalf of some a, a relative or a friend and said, in fact, he was a prayer request. His name is uh, Devin Trahan. She said, would you, would you please go pray? for my friend's son. He had been in a car accident. He's in ICU at Lafayette General. He's on life support. Yes, ma'am. I get there and I met with the mom first before we went in because I didn't know what to expect. And she listed out every single medical situation that he is dealing with. I got overwhelmed with the amount of information that I was trying to process. I didn't want to look overwhelmed, but I could. she probably could tell I was overwhelmed. And so I said, well, look, I would like to go in there. In fact, the, the, the nurses, I told them that I was a pastor, and normally they allow us to go in even if it's, uh, if it's not visiting hours. And so I walked in. And I'm telling you, there was a sweet fragrance in, in that room. The mom, let me tell you, she encouraged me. She inspired me. And that happens a lot. And so I got a chance to pray for him, to pray for her. I was probably in there a good 30, 45 minutes. It, it was just, I, I didn't want to leave. Does that make sense? And so... If you're familiar with Lafayette General ICU, it's just a wall of win uh, of windows, glass. The door plus a couple windows for each room. And there are rooms on each side in ICU of the nurse's station. I don't know, there might be six on one side and six on the other. And I was in the far corner of this one right here. Nurse's station is here and there's another row of rooms over here. And so as I'm talking to the mom, I'm looking out the glass and I see another room. And then it hit me. Three years ago, I was in that room. I had just had cancer surgery. And about three weeks later, I, got, I went into septic shock. And I had to be rushed to the hospital. And they only gave me three to four hours to live. 
And I don't know how I wound up in ICU, but I did. And it was room 535. And so I'm standing here ministering to this mama with her 26-year-old son on life support. And then it hit me. That was my room. And so something rose up in me. I saw an opportunity. And I said, I ain't passing this one up. And so I encouraged her. I said, ma'am, you see that room right there? I said, I was in that room three years ago. A couple hours of maybe being gone from this earth. But can I encourage you, mama, that God raised me out of that sickbed. And I am here today as a testimony to God's goodness. And let me tell you, the goosebumps on top of the goose, and I got them right now. But there was something that rose up in me because there was an opportunity. And I said, I am not going to just walk away from that opportunity. She got encouraged. I got encouraged. And so I told her goodbye. Didn't stop there. Because I was on a supernatural healing high, if that makes any sense. I walked out, and as I'm walking out, I said, I'm going by that room where I was in, 535. And there was a nurse that was coming right by it. I said, ma'am, hold up. I said, you see that room right there? I said, three years ago, I had cancer surgery, and God raised me out of my sickbed, and I am here today as a testimony to what God did for me. And she said, security. Just kidding. And I could tell I had freaked her out, you know. But I didn't care because there was another opportunity that I was not going to miss. Amen. And she looked at me like, okay, what do I do with this information? But I felt like I had to say something. I was not going to miss that opportunity. Amen. And I walked out of that hospital. You could have put bears in front of me and I would have taken them out. It was an opportunity that I could not pass up. Amen. I wonder how many opportunities are we missing? Because we're afraid, we're fearful. But can I tell you, we just need one more. Amen? One more. The T of BLT is take the time to write down the people, make a list, even at your home, of maybe people that you need to build relationships with and get a little closer into their life and get into their world. Oh, the power of one. Amen. When you write down these names and you get around them, it's when you say, Lord, give me opportunities. Let me build relationships with these people. Because, Lord, you died for every one of these people. Lord, give me just one more person that I can speak to. And let me tell you this. When you see somebody get radically changed because of them making a decision, for Christ, it's going to be infectious in you. And you're going to want to do it again. And you see, you're going to say, Lord, give me one more. Lord, help us 
to give us an open door to not just build, to not just look for opportunities, but maybe, Lord, to pray for them. And here's the great news. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to know all the answers. Sometimes when you're building relationships, you, you can do it in, in, in a few minutes. It may take a couple years. But you know what I'm talking about. When you get into their world, you want to get deep into their world. And don't pass up. When you see a co-worker who comes in with a, 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 a frown on their face like something's wrong, don't miss that opportunity. Hey, are you okay? No. I just got word that my dad has cancer. Oh, man. I am so sorry. Is there something I can do for you? No, my, my wife and I are good. How, how about we, can, can we cook a meal for you? Okay, that, that, that's fine. I'm telling you, it's going to open up a door. Notice things when people walk in to your world and take advantage of these opportunities. Amen. I want to go back to Acts chapter 13 and verse 47. It says this, For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles. That you, you, and you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. I don't know if y'all truly understand the immensity of that word you. Do you realize that you is you is you? And me, amen. That we have a call on our life to be part of the building the kingdom. And we can't wait for just the people to come here so we can do it. We have to get out there and do it. And you know where I'm talking, where you work, where you live. It could be a fishing buddy. It could be a golf buddy. It doesn't matter. Build that relationship. Look for that opportunity and put their name down and begin praying for that person and their family. And you are going to see something miraculous take place in them. Amen. And God's going to give you divine appointments. And you're going to go, that's God. How many of you would like just a fresh passion for people? Amen. Please stand. Hallelujah. Just signify with your hand raised how many of you would just like a fresh passion to just reach out to people and, and, and just be loving and, and take an interest in them. I, I never said the word evangelism, did I? Yeah, I, I, I believe that God would want us to just have a fresh vision for people to look at them as Jesus would look at them. Jesus ate with the tax collectors and the sinners. Oh, help us, Lord, to be mindful of those people that are needing. They're needing. Lord, you've called us to be a light to the Gentiles. That's telling me that they're in darkness if you've called us to be the light. And so, Lord, tonight I just pray over this congregation and those that are watching online that you would fill our cup to overflowing. To understand, Lord, that we don't need a stick of dynamite to try to evangelize. But, Lord, we just simply need to learn how to look at people 
as you look at them and just understand, Lord, that they may be hurting, they may be in need of something. And so, Lord, I pray that you help this congregation, you help those online understand, Lord, that you have given us the command and you've said you bring them salvation. You be a light. Father, I pray over everyone that raised their hand, Lord, that there would be a fresh passion in each one of these. Lord, that we would be mindful of people and we would not be so self-centered. But Lord, it would be simply about others. Help us, Lord, to not be so focused on our DMs, on Facebook and Instagram, but more focused on the people out there that need us, that need to hear the gospel. Lord, give us a heart to reach. Give us a heart, Lord, to see people that need you. And may there be a divine appointment that we're able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. Lord, I pray that you infuse your DNA in each of these, Lord, that as we reach out, that we will see lives changed, families changed, and your goodness and your faithfulness to come through to these people that we're reaching out to, for it's in your precious and holy name that we pray. And everybody said, Amen and Amen and Amen. Amen. Hey, it's all about one more. Amen. The power of one more. Just remember that. The power of one more. Hey, we're so glad you came tonight. Remember, Sunday, 9 and 11. Amen. Can't wait to see you and to hear testimonies of how you were able to say, hey, God gave me one more. Amen. Good to see you. Y'all have a safe trip home. Amen. Thank you.